Welcome back to another episode of Clare Schools. Today I'm going to be talking about the admissions interview, which is the last piece of information that we collect about an applicant when deciding whether or not to make them an offer. Now that doesn't mean that the interview is the most important piece of information or that the interview is the final hurdle uh, which is then to be jumped over or crashed into um, on an applicant's road to Cambridge. That's not the way it works. Uh, to see the interview in the whole context of the admissions process, do have a look at my Cambridge application process video. Um, I've put a link in the description down below. So the purpose of this video is to talk in some detail about what actually goes on uh, in the interview room and to tell you a little bit about the kinds of things that we're looking for uh, from an applicant in interview. But before I do that, I thought I'd give you a little bit of um, practical information to begin with. Um, so once you've made your application to a college, either directly to a particular college or indirectly via an open application, you'll usually hear if you've got an interview about two or three weeks uh, before the interview, so two or three weeks usually before the first couple of weeks of December. Um, now, every college would love to interview every applicant it gets, but sadly from an administrative point of view that's just not possible. Uh, so on average, Cambridge interviews about three quarters of all applicants. Now, as you might have guessed from what I just said, interviews take place around the first couple of weeks of December. Now, one of the reasons for that um, broad date range is that there are natural variations year on year based on term dates. Um, but a more important reason is that the interviews are run by the individual colleges. There are 29 undergraduate colleges. Um, and that also makes it quite difficult to generalise completely accurately about the exact practicalities of the experience you'll have. Now, later on, when I talk about the, sort of the main body of this video in a couple of minutes, the, the spirit of the interview, what's the spirit of what's going on in the room, um, why we're doing it, um, the kinds of things you can expect in that regard, I can generalise with more accuracy, um, with a lot of confidence. But here, um, all I can say is this is likely to be the case in terms of practicalities, um, but be prepared for it not to be quite as I say. So what is likely to be the case is that you will have two interviews um, in one day at one college and each interview is likely to be with two academics. Now, How the two academics will share the interview, by the way, will vary. So it might be the case that you'll have one question from one and then another question from another and back and forth for kind of 50-50 split like that. It might be a 50-50 split in another way. So maybe it will be if it's a 20 minute interview, 10 minutes from one academic and then 10 minutes from the next one. It might be more like 70-30, it might be 100-0, it might be just one academic doing all of the talking and the other one just sat there. Um, so just be prepared for that, don't be put off, um, be ready for, for any kind of split. In terms of where actually to go, um, you'll be given sort of room numbers and stuff where you're, the actual rooms that you have your interview, but you don't really need to worry too much about that because as soon as you turn up at the college where you're having your interview, um, it will be full of student helpers in bright and sometimes fluorescent t-shirts. They'll be really eager to talk to you, uh, to stop you from getting lost in case you were going to get lost, to lead you to your interview, um, to answer any questions you might have. It's a really supportive atmosphere, uh, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, equally, if you're coming from a long way away or you've got an early morning interview or both, um, colleges will be able to offer you overnight accommodation in some cases uh, and they will contact you about that um, if it's something you need. Uh, and also colleges are able to offer financial help with the travel um, to and from uh, interview if you need it. So on to the main part of the video then. You've made it to the college, um, your friendly student helper has shown you to your interview room what can you expect to actually go on inside? Well, there are no secrets here. We're looking to see what you'd be like to teach. We're looking to test how you think. And we're looking to test how you think beyond um, your current knowledge um, and how you apply that knowledge to things that you mo might not immediately understand. And that's exactly what will happen day in, day out um, on any Cambridge course. Now you should expect to practice the subject for which you've applied in some detail in at least one of the interviews. And that goes even for subjects uh, for which you've never studied before at school. So that means for science, you can expect to be set a question or a problem. For humanities, uh, you can expect to be set uh, a text, an image, something along those lines. Now a common, but by no means the absolute standard pattern is to have one interview uh, that does that, so practices the subject, gets down and actually does the subject that you're applying for, and then one interview that's a, a slightly uh, greater remove, 
Um, so it does a little bit of practicing the subject, but also talks about your interests in that subject a bit more generally. Um, that second interview is still very much academic in focus and we're still looking for the same things. We're still testing how you think. We're looking to see how you are thinking about um, the kinds of things that you've been reading and doing. To test how you think, we're going to ask you questions to which you won't immediately know the answers. Obviously, if you know the answer immediately, you're not thinking. You're just applying knowledge that you've already got. And we want to see how you think, not what you know. It's important, though, to emphasize that knowledge, I'm not saying knowledge is not important at all. We want a very solid grounding, uh, completely competent grounding in your school subjects. Um, and that includes GCC. Everything you've covered up to now at the interview, um, you need to be conversant in because that's the knowledge that you can then apply to any question that you're asked and say oh I did this in school I know a little bit about this maybe I can apply this knowledge and take it further. So to take a science example first you might get a question in a natural sciences interview something like um, can you estimate the mass of the earth's atmosphere? Now that's a question that you're not going to know the answer to uh, you're not going to have seen that kind of question worked through to a full answer in a school textbook. Now, even if somehow you do know the answer or a rough figure, that's not going to help. The important thing is the process by which you reach your estimate. So you might start by thinking about the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. That's something that I could just about do if I think back to GCC physics. I'm thinking like 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and that I've already reached 100, so that's slightly wrong. But you know what I mean. And you're thinking about all of those. You're thinking about the density then of the gases. Uh, you might run into problems as you think, well, actually, don't gases have different densities um, at different heights above the Earth's surface? So it's becoming difficult, but you sort of go through it that way um, and reach some kind of estimate for the volume. And you'll talk about those difficulties um, as you go and be challenged on them. And the important thing is to sort of be very rigorous with every step you take along the process, to be thinking out loud, um, talking, communicating your process of thought um, with the interviewer. So they uh, are alive to exactly what's going through your head. Now you could also think about atmospheric pressure uh, and then the total surface area of the Earth. That one's a little bit beyond me, more than a bit beyond me, um, but I'm reliably informed that that's another good way to, to reach an answer, perhaps even a slightly better one. Now you may well get asked a question to which there is no answer or certainly no exact answer, and that should certainly emphasize two things. The first is that the answer is not important, it's all about the process as I've been saying, um, and the second one is that you shouldn't be disheartened if you don't reach the answer um, over the course of the interview. Um, you'll be asked a very big question that it will take a long time um, for you to get near solving. Um, I'm not, obviously, it's great if you do manage to find the answer, fantastic. But, you know, most people won't do that with that kind of question. Um, so don't sort of talk yourself out of doing well by starting to think, oh, I'm being really slow. Um, as I say, it's the process and being rigorous and being thorough in what you do is, is a good thing. So for an arts example, and I'll take English just because it's my home territory, you might in an English interview be given a poem or another short text um, and be given say five or ten minutes before the interview or half an hour maybe to think about it um, and then when you go into the interview you'll be asked to discuss it. Now an impulse that often applicants will have uh, when presented with that kind of task is to go straight for the the jugular of the poem, what they think to be the jugular, and talk about a general interpretation um, of what they think it means, how it fits in with context, um, a basically a, a stock response, we might call it. Um, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for real sort of forensic, as with that, as I said, being thorough with the science example, a real thoroughness to the way you read. So you want to be going through the poem um, word by word, line by line, talking about um, why, why this word, what does it mean? What, what does this line mean? Why is the poet chosen to express themselves in this way? So those kinds of issues, issues of diction and, and word choice, those kinds of really forensic issues um, are what we want from you, um, what we want you to talk about. Um, obviously, you could eventually lead up to some sort of broader interpretation, but that's where you want to start. And if you don't start there, um, you can expect to be dragged back there um, by the interviewer. So you can expect the interviewer to keep asking you, what do you understand by this line? What do you understand by this word? Why do you think this word, this line has been chosen? Um, how would the poem alter? How would it differ um, if this word had been used instead? All those kinds of questions. Now it doesn't matter if you don't always have an answer to those questions or you don't always immediately have an answer to those questions. The point is to be open to that kind of spirit of forensic inquiry. 
Um, so you're leaving at the door basically those kinds of stock responses, um, the immediate sort of jumping to conclusions about what this poem is about, what it's doing. Um, if you feel that you've got that all weighed up and, and sorted out um, after a few minutes before the interview in, in your reading time, um, the chances are, not necessarily, but the chances are you're probably wrong. Um, so you, you want to just always be open to being challenged. And okay, you can push back a little bit. The point of the interview is not just to s sit there and say, yes, uh, the interviewer's way of reading things, uh, not that I'll necessarily present that, is definitely right. So you can push back, um, but also you don't want to push back the whole time and always say, no, this is what I think, this is what it means. Uh, if you do that, the interview, maybe according to common sense, is not going to go very well. So interviews are a great way of testing what you'd be like to teach. Now, not always, but a lot of the time you will be interviewed um, by at least one person who might be your potential supervisor. Um, now, I've recorded a video about the supervision system. Um, I'll put a link to that as well as the application process video down below. Now, one of my main points in that supervision system video is that supervisions exist to communicate and teach um, ways of thinking, not to communicate and, uh, and teach facts um, and knowledge. Um, because that can be done much more efficiently in something like uh, a lecture or a seminar. So I really want to drum home this point that the best piece of advice that anyone can give you um, about the Cambridge interview is that it's all about mental flexibility. So you want to be communicating your thought process so the interviewer can follow along at all times and that is absolutely what they're looking for. So how do you practice this mental flexibility, this mental agility that you'll be asked to display at interview? Well, reading, and listening and watching around your subject. Um, that's a great way to expose yourself um, constantly to new ideas, new thoughts, new ways of doing things. Um, that's a great way to sort of replicate in some form the kinds of challenges that you'll be presented with in an interview. Equally, um, conversations, another great way, ideally obviously with uh, a teacher or another expert in a subject. Um, but with an interested, a really interested friend too, who's maybe applying for the same subject to, to a good university, um, that's great as well. And there's another way of kind of simulating that kind of challenge that you'll, you'll be presented with at interview. Now remember that talking solely about your subject for 20 to 25 minutes, say, um, is a pretty unique experience and not something you're likely to have done much before. So the more practice you can get in that regard, the better. So as I say, talking to your teachers, talking to your friends. Um, it's good for just making yourself more comfortable in that kind of conversation too. That said, the benefit of a, a formal uh, mock interview, um, I'm not sure is, is really that great. Um, it's really hard to replicate um, the conditions of, of the actual interview, for one thing, the nerves. Um, then there's no way of guaranteeing that the person interviewing you, because there are a lot of misconceptions about the whole process, um, that they'll know actually what they're doing or know exactly how to be an interviewer. Um, so don't worry at all uh, if, if you've got no opportunity for a formal mock interview. Um, and if you do, and if you are presented with that opportunity, um, I would suggest taking it with a little pinch of salt. A final practical point before we end, um, you may notice over the course of the interview that, that the interviewers um, like to take notes. Um, don't be put off by this. Um, Often an interviewer will see uh, in excess of a dozen candidates in a day and the reason they're taking notes is not because um, it's, it's not like a driving instructor does to sort of mark down all your faults. They're doing it to do you justice um, so they're, they're, they're not relying on their memory. If they're seeing 12 candidates in a day, they can't at the end of the day sort of think back as clearly as they would like to exactly what's happened with each candidate. So they're writing notes just to remind themselves uh, when they're thinking back over the interview has gone of what's been discussed. So that's what's going on when they're taking notes. They're not writing down sort of uh, error or, or anything like that. So that should be enough for now. I'm aware that I've in no way covered everything. Um, if you've got questions about anything else, if you've got questions in response to uh, what I have addressed, um, we're always really, really happy to, to get those in the comments. Um, please do ask and, and I will respond to them. Um, as always, I'd encourage you to, to like this video, um, to share it and to subscribe to the channel. Um, otherwise, as usual, stay safe and take care.